Hello everyone, welcome back into the studio for some casting. Today we're going to be casting the skull that we sculpted and made a mohawk mold of. If you haven't seen those other series where we sculpt and make the mold, and are interested in seeing those, and how we got to this point, check out those videos before watching this one. Let's get into it. Let's first talk about what you will need to follow along with this series. You need plaster, of course. A regular casting plaster, like Plaster of Paris or something similar, will work just fine. Burlap is usually used for reinforcing plaster, making it stronger, stronger while keeping it light. We won't be using it today, but it's a useful material that's often used in both mold making and casting. We got some knives and some rasps for cleaning up plaster that goes places it shouldn't. There won't be much of that, hopefully. I like the yellow Stanley rasps for rasps and for knives, anything really goes. Disposable gloves can be useful, but it's not necessary when working with plaster. Working without makes your hands very dry, plaster does that to you. So I wear them today, but I don't always wear gloves when working with plaster. Vaseline is used to make sure plaster doesn't stick to something that it shouldn't, usually itself. We might not use that today either, but it is very useful to have in your mold making and casting toolkit for working with plaster. Brown packing tape will be used for holding the two model mold halves of the mold together, keeping the mold closed so that we can work within it. Rubber balls are great for mixing plaster in. They are flexible so we can easily get the plaster out of the ball once the plaster is set, making clean up a breeze. I got a couple of different sizes here. You can get these at places that sell stuff for art restoration and also in some high-end art stores which focus on sculpture. Brushes will be used a little bit here to manipulate the plaster around inside the mold. Disposable ones, of course, as the plaster will kill your brush fairly quickly. And some metal spatulas, another item we'll be using minimally here, but they are something you need in your plaster toolkit. The mold itself, of course, more on that soon. And some clay, which we'll use to seal areas of our mold where we don't want the plaster to go. This can be a messy process, so it's good to have some clay around in case of leaks as well. As I said, messy process. So we have some old casting shoes that have seen better days, but now at least they have built-in airflow. And of course, my trusty denim apron, which has seen many mold making and casting battles with me for the last 10 years or so. These are useful items to keep your clothes from being ruined during all of this. And finally, a bucket of water for cleaning tools and hands in. We don't want plaster to get in the sink, so a slosh bucket like this is the way to go. Here we have the mold that we made in a previous series, which you should check out if you haven't already. It's a mohawk mold, which just means that there is a cut along the back of the head where you expect to see a mohawk on someone. This cut, instead of having two silicone halves, is going to be the way in which the mold, in which we get the silicone off of our cast. The model mold is made of two halves because they can't flex like the silicone, being made out of a hard material like plaster. The model mold cradles the silicone and keeps the flexible silicone from losing its shape. The mold is held together with simple brown packing tape, which is preferred because it doesn't flex or stretch like duct tape does, so it keeps its shape better and holds the mold together for longer with no changes. So if you want to store your mold, as well, storing it closed with brown packing tape is definitely the way to go, as duct tape is going to stretch. At the end of the mohawk cut, there is a little round hole from a wooden dowel that got stuck in our clay and went through our silicone. This is going to keep the silicone from tearing as we flex our mold open to get the casting out of the mold. If you don't have this or something similar, 
because there are other solutions as well, the silicone can begin to tear after use and the mohawk cut will extend further and further down into the face of your sculpture. It won't stop at the hairline anymore. Eventually destroying your mold, of course. The cut along the mohawk has been made using a silicone knife which has a registration groove in it. This means there is a positive and a negative channel on either side of the cut. This forces the mohawk cut back together in the same way every time without fail. The mold goes together like so and packing tape is wrapped around it to hold it together. Don't tighten the packing tape too much as it can make the silicone edge compress, changing the shape of your sculpture. This is one of the negatives of having an open edged mold. You have to be a little careful with the amount of pressure you apply when closing the mold. We're going to do a little more to this mold before we begin, but first I want to show you how to mix a proper bowl of plaster. Mixing plaster sounds like it should be easy, but there is plenty that can go wrong here, leading to poor plaster, poor castings, or sometimes a major mess. So let's go over the proper procedure, which is how you will mix every single bowl of plaster you will ever make. Plaster can and should only be mixed in one way. First fill your bowl with water. About one third is what I would do max, as the plaster takes up a lot of space inside the water, so if you add more water than one third, the bowl can overflow. Always add water first, and then you begin adding the plaster powder into the water. The plaster powder should be sifted slowly into the water and allowed to sink between every new cup of plaster that you add to it. If you sift slowly, this sort of will happen by default. Try to make sure no big lumps of plaster gets in there. Sifting slowly also helps with this. Keep sifting the plaster powder into the bowl until the plaster reaches the surface of the water. We should have plaster powder sitting ever so slightly above the water level. Do not make a mountain. We need the water to soak into the plaster. Try to get the plaster into the bowl evenly so that the plaster isn't just in the middle of the bowl, but evenly dispersed throughout the entire surface. Too much water in relation to plaster powder will lead to weak plaster. The plaster and water is allowed to sit for a minute or two. This lets the water soak into the plaster powder and will let you mix a lot less once you're ready to work. Less mixing means less air bubbles in the plaster and therefore a plaster that is stronger and with a longer open time as well. The plaster won't really start setting up on you until you mix it with the water, mix the plaster and the water together, so you can let this bowl sit for a little bit actually. 
Eventually it will harden, but waiting a few minutes to minimize the amount of mixing you have to do and increasing the evenness of our plaster, that can only benefit us. Then we mix using a spatula. It shouldn't take too much if you've done everything up to now correctly. Mixing more agitates the plaster, making it set up faster, and you will also get more bubbles, which matters a lot for the casting techniques that we will be using today. As you can see, the plaster is nice and creamy, not too thin and not too thick. It pours nicely, but also stays in place in a thin layer when we rotate the bowl around. This is ideal for what we're about to do with the plaster, but also very good plaster to work with in general. I always mix my plaster this exact way with very little variation, leading to a good plaster and usually yielding good results.